Selfie Society. I'm Professor Chambliss. Uh, the course uh, in the Hamilton catalog is called Selfie Society. It really properly should be called something like Sociology of Everyday Life or even Social Phenomenology, which is a big word I'll explain to you in a minute. Uh, the point of the course, um, in a way, is to explore the relationship between how we experience life as individuals and how we do that in a context with lots of other people. That is to say, it's a really, really close to philosophy class. Right? So it's kind of a combination of a certain kind of philosophy that explores conscious experience and, oh, that's, a, that's not quite the right way, not conscious experience, but let's say experience, uh, and how we live with other people. So the first half of the course is really kind of about the self and figuring out what that means and what it means to have a self. That is good. And the second half tries to then see that self in the context of the society around it. That's the simplest way to explain what we're doing. Now, throughout most of the course, we are adopting the perspective of, of a philosophical tradition uh, you can think of as existential phenomenology. Uh, what is phenomenology? Phenomenology is the study of the structure of consciousness. Well, that's a really an effort to understand the nature of experience, of how we experience them in very general kinds of terms. What does it mean to be alive? Or what is it to be a living creature? Go another way. Trust me, you'll see plenty of examples through the course. It will all become clear. I'm just giving you the, the most general outline. Now, this branch of philosophy, also the existential, existentialist branch of phenomenology, also um, includes an emphasis on the place of freedom in human activity. That is, you live, you experience life, you do stuff, and you feel like, gee, I have a choice. I could take sociology or not. I could stand up or sit down, right? And when you tell your arm to lift, that's pretty cool, right? You've got sort of free will in some sense, or you feel like you've got free will. And that tradition, which is really important, comes from a bunch of philosophers, including Martin Heidegger, and Jean-Paul Sartre, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and people like that, okay? And we're gonna talk about all those people, especially Merleau-Ponty. Uh, but they were concerned with, what is it to be a free human being? And how does that, so to speak, work. That's sort of the first half of the form. The second half is much more what you would recognize as sociology. That is, basic and basic part of that is people don't actually act like they're free. They act in really, really predictable ways. And famous sort of example, I could tell you with pretty good accuracy how many people in the state of New York will next year commit suicide? I don't know. I probably don't know any of them, God will. Right? But I can give you the number pretty darn accurately. How's that possible? Right? How is it possible that sociologists, and economists, and political scientists and stuff can actually predict all sorts of things about people, at least in groups, and yet we're still free, right? We could do anything. We just run off in a random direction. So sociology, social psychology of this variety, is interested in part in how you reconcile those two features of human existence. That is, people are free, but they don't act like they're free. Well, how does that work? That's what the course is really about, is trying to reconcile those two now, let's go back to phenomenology in a little more detail now, because this is 
most of what we're doing in the first half. Okay. Phenomenology is the study of the structure of consciousness. And it was invented, or the, the name at least, of this branch philosophy was coined by a guy named Edmund Husserl. You don't need to know. H-U-S-S-E-R in 1900 or thereabouts. And he then had some very famous followers like Martin Heidegger and later Jean-Paul Sartre. Okay. Um, phenomenology is the study of the structure of consciousness. What does that mean? Another phrase that gets used for it is the organization of experience. We want to understand how experience is organized. Let me give you an example. Here's a joke. Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. Fruit flies? Banana? Yeah? Okay. So this is a Groucho Marx joke. It's a really elegant joke. It actually has three different puns of various sorts involved in a single joke. It's a good joke. And you might, I mean, a few people chuckle, you know, <laughs> politely. <laughs> that is to say, you understand that it's funny, right? So you know funny when you see funny. Right? But can you tell me why it's funny? I mean, you could probably explain the different puns and kind of how the joke works. But that's mechanical, right? Any, you know, anybody, you know, a smart person can try to figure that out. But your laughter happened before you figured that out, right? In other words, somewhere in you, you spontaneously know funny when you see it. And yet explaining what makes something funny turns out to be incredibly difficult. And a lot of really, really smart people have worked on it a lot. In other words, there's something in the way that you hear that joke or you kind of grasp that chunk of the world that makes you laugh. You have a, a visceral reaction to it. Now, what phenomenology tries to do is figure out what, what is it about that grasp? How did you connect to the world such that you have this spontaneous reaction called fun? Okay? It's trying to explain the structure of consciousness, the way your awareness kind of reached out and grabbed that. Different example. What makes somebody sexually attractive? Okay. <laughs> you know, right? I mean, you don't know like you've got a little list in your head. Check one, check two, check one. Right? That's not quite the way it works. You don't go to a Bundy party or whatever, and you, you, know, you see somebody like, <laughs> and you're like, whoa. <laughs> right? You know, that's not... You don't have a list, right? You don't have rules, but you know hot when you see hot. Or see or perceive or smell or whatever it is, right? And we could try to figure out, it's different for different people, I got that part. And there are general conditions, and you say, well, you know, you have to be physically, you know, the business stuff, but, okay? But it turns out it's not that easy to describe. In fact, it's very, very difficult to describe. Now, a phenomenologist would try to describe it, not in the sense of what makes one person attractive or not, but in the general sense of can we describe what it means to be erotically appealing? What it, or put it differently, what is eroticism? You know, and why is it that some people get excited by women's shoes, for instance, and some people don't? What is it about the way that person, their consciousness reaches out and grabs the world. Okay? More general kind of example of this would be what makes something interesting at all. So right now, I mean, judging from your faces and body posture and stuff, I'm guessing a decent number of you think this is kind of interesting. What I'm talking about, right? I can see it in your posture. Right? Not everybody. <laughs> you got that. Okay, I'm good. Right? But basically you find that Interesting. Well, what is interesting? What does that mean? What's going on when you find something interesting? Well, a guy named Murray Davis, a sociologist who died about three or four years ago, wrote a whole article it's called, what, called That's Interesting. He also wrote a book called uh, That's Funny. 
And he was into this kind of stuff. And he wrote a whole article about what makes something interesting. What is it about the way we, again, perceive the world? Okay. That's the kind of stuff that phenomenology deals with. It's trying to state in general kind of principal terms how does our consciousness leave that term on its for now, but our experience of the world, how is it shaped? Right? How does it connect with stuff around us in ways that we recognize in that way? So Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a famous little book uh, uh, called uh, what was it called? Uh, Houston, uh, like Foundations of a Theory of Emotion. And he tried to describe what is an emotion. What is, how do we live an emotion? What, what's going on there when you say, get really angry and somebody starts screaming and swearing? What's going on there? The short version of his answer was, it's basically an attempt to magically transform the world to escape from a situation. And you go, ah! You know, if I just swear or not, this will be what I mean. <coughs> But that's the short version. All right. So, the interesting part about a lot of this stuff is you have the answers. That is to say, you know what's sexually appealing. You know what's funny. I mean, my, my grandson's two years old. He knows funny. Okay? If you make faces or something, he'll laugh. If you, he'll see something on TV and they change something. <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> Nobody told him how to do that. Right? He has some perception of the world that captures what's funny. So you know what's funny, right? You know it in the sense of you live that. But explaining it, very, very tough. That's what we're trying to do, is move from knowing in the sense of living to actually um, uh, being able to articulate some of these things. Okay. Now, uh, the second part of existential phenomenology is existentialism, which is the free will kind of argument and so on, that we'll get into next time in the discussion in real detail. We're going to read for Thursday um, Jean-Paul Sartre's essay, what's uh, called Existentialism in your book, but it's uh, Existentialism is Humanism is another way to title. It's not particularly long. It's easy to read in the sense of the language is understandable, but you've got to really pay attention to what it's talking about. Right? But it's, it's good. And it's a classic sort of defense or argument in favor of almost unlimited human freedom in our actions. And the implications of that are pretty profound. So, all right. so here's what's going to happen for most of today. I'm going to give you a one lecture introduction to the topic of the course and I'm going to do it in the form of a sentence which you see on your notes. The sentence is I live in a meaningful world and we're going to go through that sentence word by word and I'll try to explain to you where we're headed with this whole thing. Okay? We're good so far. All right. By the way, in this course, a lot of the it's a very personal course for me. Um, I actually first taught a version of this in 1977. <laughs> when I was 27 years old and you were, <laughs> well, not. <laughs> Alright, it was a long time ago. It, and it, it I was 20, uh, yeah. I started on it when I was 24, started working on it. Stuff because I got into this material when I was in college. So what you'll see, a lot of the stuff in the course, I'm giving you examples out of mm, my life. Not because I'm such a fascinating guy. Okay, I'm not. It's, you know, I've been a college teacher for 30 years. How interesting can be? Uh, no, I don't mean um, but, um, uh, but I'm trying, but what I want you to do is not think about these as examples about Dan, you know. It's, it's, so that you can try to translate it in your own life. That is, take the example and try to see, oh, 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 this sort of thing happened to me. There's something similar, right? So you understand. It's to give you a vivid notion 
of what these ideas mean in real terms. Okay, that's the that's the point. All right. So when we say I live in a meaningful world, I I have my own world in the sense of meaningful world. We're not talking about the globe, you know, the geological earth. We're talking about my lived world. What German philosophers call my Lebensfeld, my lived world. Like I experience life in a particular way. And it's mine. Nobody else has the same one. Right? Nobody else has the same one. Um, I have my own point of view, and that may be different. I have my history. So uh, let's say I personally, I grew up in Tennessee. I lived in Florida for a while. I've been here since 1981. I don't think that's true of anybody else around. I mean, there's one person I went to high school with, actually, who teaches here. John O'Neill in the French department. Actually, went to high school with Go figure. Right? But other than that, and in a lot of ways, we don't have much else in common, you know? But you know, we got Tennessee in here. That's good. Right? So there's overlap. But your life, in that sense, is unique, right? Especially in the modern world. You have very different career paths and everything from, from all the other people around you. Second is that uh, I have my own, um, uh, my own physical existence, so my body. So let's say I'm like 5'7". And I can tell you, it's really interesting. I, I, um, some years back, my feet started hurting because of, you know, the arches fell. So I had to get orthotics. Like things that go in your shoe that have a large support. So I started learning. I'm like an inch and a half tall. <laughs> Big guy. <laughs> right? I mean you make you move from five seven to five nine, it changes your perspective on the world. And I thought, God, no wonder tall people look confident. <laughs> and I wasn't even that tall. <laughs> you see? But it, just that little bit of shift, and you know this if you wear heels or anything of the sort, right? You realize, wow, that makes a big difference. Or, or your physical bulk, same kind of, kind of thing, right? When I gain, I weigh, oh, I weigh 30 pounds more than I did when I was your age. Two, you were thin, thin guy. I was, made a big difference. Um, anyway, so, so your, your physical presence makes a big difference too, right? If you're male or female, it makes a huge difference in the way you experience the world, the way you move, see things, and so on. Okay. Not to mention, you know, if uh, God forbid you, uh, you go blind or something, huge transition in the world as you perceive it. Right? So my height example was just to show you how a very small difference in that physical connectedness to the world suddenly transforms the way you see it. So another version of the height thing. When I was in high school, uh, I was an athlete. Believe it or not, uh, I was a I was a competitive swimmer, and I was on this really good team that had maybe 35 guys. We were state champions and all that, and um, it was all boys prep school. And um, I didn't realize it exactly. Well, I sort of realized it. I was the smallest guy on the team. I mean, I was five seven, 130 pounds, you know, right? And I would get up on the blocks like in the finals, stick me, and I'm looking at them. You know, it's like this. <laughs> I, I, so I was very conscious of being a little guy. Right? And I went, I went, I went to college. I didn't even notice at first. I went to college. I'm like, boy, I just, I was, I was a big man on campus from day one at college. And it, it was probably six months before I realized, like, hey, I'm literally physically larger than most of the people at this school. And the reason is the college had no athletic program. Zero. <laughs> Every big guy had been taken somewhere else. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> right? But I didn't even realize it. But again, your physical situation connects you to the world. So that's unique to different people. All right. So third point here. I live in a meaningful world. I, it's shaped by my goals. The way I perceive things is shaped by what I'm trying to or to put it differently, it's shaped by my future. So uh, here I am standing in front of you guys, and I'm trying to like be entertaining and amusing and interesting. 
good teaching stuff. And that really matters to me, so that shapes what I do with you. Um, uh, uh, you, you're being a student, right? so you're doing student-like stuff right now, which means you're being quiet, you're taking notes, or at least writing something on paper, <laughs> right? or typing or whatever. Uh, you're trying to do the student thing. And that shapes the way, for instance, you're dressed right now, uh, the way you carry yourself, the way you look, the way you move in your head, all of those things are shaped by that sort of goal. Different example of this um, uh, could be on a very micro level, um, you play pool, billiards, pool, people. Okay, so I used to play pool a lot when I was in high school. I mean, at one point, a lot, as in three, four hours a night. I got into a big, big way. But one of the funny things about playing pool a lot, I mean, all you're doing, it's, it's all angles, and, you, know, you know, all sorts of things. Anyway, but you're always looking at all these different configurations. And I found myself walking down the street and seeing people coming toward me. I went, oh, I put that guy in the side pocket. <laughs> you know, because you can see, you line it up, you go, oh, come on, off the bank, you know, come on. So you start seeing things that way. Like if you play video games too much, you do that too. Start seeing people and stuff. Or if you're an artist, right? You're taking a drawing class, let's say, and you realize part of what it means to be able to draw is to stop seeing the world as objects that exist that are moving, that have meaning, right? You try to get rid of the name of the object almost. You just want to see what you see, which turns out to be quite difficult to do. But if you start doing it, suddenly you start seeing the world differently. Right? So if you, I, if you know Matisse at all, um, in college I read an art book, and I didn't study art at all, I just read this book, and here's this stuff about Matisse, and I walked outside of my dorm, and I looked, and suddenly I saw the dorm across from me as this white strip, and then there was an orange strip of the sunset above it, and there were these three palm trees that were just straight brown lines. Wow! And this guy came out. I said, Look at this! This is a door! And he looks at me like I'm a moron. He says, That's art. You know, that's the whole point, right? If you start seeing the world differently because you're coming at it a certain way, right? And so how we come at the world dramatically affects the way we see it, even physically see it. Okay, so this is all I, you know, my own doing of things sort of shapes the world that I live in. All right, second, I live in the world. Okay, that is to say I'm alive. I'm actively doing stuff. I'm not just a physical object. Now, I am a physical object, right? That's, that's going on, and we'll get into the details about that. But I'm also living. That is, um, and it says here, it's, it's a relation. It's not a placement. I'm not just physically placed in the world. I'm doing things. And I'm connecting to the world all the time. Connecting is in the wrong way. Uh, I'm in the flow of it, you might say, all the time. Right? And I move and I affect them. So, uh, you know, if I walk around this room, right? talk about this in the intro class sometimes, you know, if I walk around this room, it changes the way you feel things right now, and it changes your blood pressure just a little bit, makes your pulse go up if I get close to you, let's say, and your eyes, it's not just that your eyes move, your, your emotions kind of shift a little, like, oh, shoot, what's this guy capable of? You don't quite know what might happen, and that affects things. So at the most minor level, if you walk into the room, the temperature of the room goes up. I mean, the physical temperature of the room goes up. And, gee, there might be a government agency outside in the van right now, and they know that. They see a little heat spot going by before they come in and they bust it for selling dope on campus. Right? Right? You've changed the room by being here, and you've changed everybody else in the room by being here, especially if they know you or they think you're sexually attractive, or they think you're funny. These are examples, right? You've changed things by showing up. 
So you're alive and you're you're shifting the world around just by just by being in. Now, when we say you're in the world, I live in the world. Um, years back, my younger brother gave me a basketball for Christmas. It's in this. I just had to package it with a huge, huge, perfect, huge box, all wrapped up. Woo! Rip, 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 tear, tear, tear. I pull it open. There's a basket. And I reach down, I lift it out. So elegant. I mean, the packaging is perfect. You ever want to watch my packaging? I mean, it's just a cube inside of which is a globe. Wow, how fabulous. I thought the ball was in the box. Okay, I could put the ball back in, I could take the box back, I could take the ball back out. But there was the box and there was the ball. They're separate objects. They don't affect each other. Okay? So I'm in the world, but it's not like the basketball. It's not like you can just put it in, take it out. The two objects are the same. They change each other. They're involved. Okay? I'm in the world, not like being put in a box. I'm in the world like I'm in love. Okay? Or I'm in a relationship. Or I'm in a good mood. When you're in a good mood, it's not like the mood was there first. And you just got stuck into it. Although there is some of that sometimes in group situations. <laughs> Which we'll talk about. We'll talk about it. You walk into a room and everybody's laughing and having a good time. You walk in, you tend to... <laughs> right? You get, you get with the spirit of the room. Second half of the course is all about a lot of stuff like that, how that works. But generally speaking, you know, I affect the mood myself, right? I am the mood. You can't be in love unless you're doing it. Okay? It's a way of relating to the world around you. And it's, it's really hard and quite arbitrary, actually, to separate the two, to separate you from the mood, right? Or separate me from the relationship. Right? It's not like the relationship is there if I don't show up. But we say I'm in a relationship with something. Okay. So it's only this is maybe yeah, okay, it's important. It's only afterwards. It's only analytically that we separate those two things. That is me from the relationship. Because we have words that will do that. Right? So talk about damn chambers. Like I'm a separate thing in the world that exists kind of out there and then can move into it and do stuff. But that's really misleading. Really misleading. I, I only exist as a separate item, in other words when somebody sits down and thinks about it and says, well, let's, what do we call that moving piece of stuff over there? Let's call that, you know, Dan or Claire or Jose or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a separate little thing. And we give it a noun name, like it's a thing, like it's a, a table. A table you can move in and out of a room. Okay, a person, yeah, but it's not the same. Okay. Now, one of the curiosity to this. Now, by the way, in your experience, you might feel like you're separated from the world. This is not a good feeling. Right? Uh, if you ever had depression, anxiety kinds of problems, that comes up a lot. Right? Where you feel distanced from the world around, like, like you feel like there's this gap. Um, very hard to describe, not pleasant. Right? But if you have had that sort of experience of distancing and so on, maybe you have some notion of what I'm talking about. But generally speaking, I'm the phrase I like to use sometimes is I'm stuck in the world. I'm trapped here. In a particular world I haven't lived. I can't get out of it. I live, I see people, I deal with stuff, here I am. That's it. And it's Philosophically impossible, let's say, to take yourself out of the world. For instance, um, um, yeah. you like watching these movies like Pride and Prejudice, 
um, you know, sort of period pieces from some years back, and, you know, Downton Abbey right now, that kind of thing. And you see people, I was talking to one of my stepdaughters, what happened, and they're like, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to live in the you know, 18th century? You know, I'd wear ball gowns and, you know, dance with, you know, all this guy kind of goes. It's kind of like an upscale version of Cinderella thing a four-year-old grandfather has, but that's not she wants to be a princess, okay. So, you know, wouldn't it be great to be a princess and live in, you know, 1770 or something? Well, that's fun to think about, but the point here is that I live in a meaningful world. I'm in it. I'm in my world. I can't not be in it. Or to put it differently, you couldn't live in you know, the time of the American Civil War is what I got there. Because it wouldn't be you. It would no longer be you, right? If I say, well, you know, what if I were what if I were a woman? And I think about that, try to imagine what that would be like. Well that's an interesting exercise. You know, it's probably good to do. But it wouldn't be me. So it's kind of cheating. You know, you're not it's a it's a fun game, but that's all it is. It's not it's no longer, you're no longer the same person because you really are who you are. That makes sense. You know? And the real you is not someplace else. You can kind of draw down at you. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, side, side comment here. Um, I, while I was writing this, I was thinking, um, Sometimes you get in arguments with people and they say, you know, the male female thing is where this comes up for me. Huh? Sometimes somebody, a woman, will say, Well, you just feel that way because you're a man. No doubt. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> uh, there's not a good response to that except to say, And you feel that way because you're a woman. <laughs> and then the other person's like, Oh my God, what do we do? <laughs> because this, the slogan that applies here is maybe everybody is somebody. We're all something, right? We all exist in the real world. And so we are all of these particulars that we actually live with. And there's no spot from outside. So the philosopher Thomas Nagel famously called science the view from nowhere. Okay? not just even God's eye view. Science is a view from nowhere. It has nothing, no perspective, so to speak. It's, it's objective is what we would call it. But no actual human being lives that way. All right, to continue. I live in a meaningful world. A, it's one of many possibles. And not just that other people have their own, although they do, obviously. We've already gone there. But that um, I sort of have my own. I sort of have a variety of worlds. If I go and spend a week with my brother in Tennessee, well, one thing you know is right away, if you, if you like snuck along behind or had a little photo cam thing, you know, you notice, I, number one, I get a southern accent really fast. Turns out that's kind of regional. If I go to Tennessee, I get a southern accent. My demeanor changes. And I start talking slowly, and I turn in like, hey, old buddy, how's it going there? You know that kind of stuff? I don't, there it is. I don't know, I'm different. I'm different people, right? And I deal with different people, different kinds of people. It shapes the way I am. Same thing is true, um, if I go to Washington, I do consulting work every so often. I go to there, and I deal with people in business and stuff. I'm a different kind of person in, in a lot of respects. It's kind of strange. It's kind of strange. Now, you can also have different worlds, not just or your home life and your work life. Things. People might be very different kinds of people at home than they are at work. But there are also other transformations of reality, you might say, that get real interesting, like the difference between, we'll get into this in detail, the difference between everyday life, that is, here we are and we're talking to each other, versus, say, being totally uh, high on drugs. Uh, uh, this is really yeah. different. You know, and if you've ever done that sort of thing, I'm not a bad baby, I'm just saying, I'm, things kind of move differently. 
and they look differently, and people act differently, and the time is, you know, all distorted, things like that. Or you have a religious experience. Right? Like you talk to God. Right? And I'm not making it, I mean, this happens. People do this, right? You might say, well, that's a little bunch of baloney to me. Well, that's you. You're in everyday life. First, you have, a, you have an experience talking to God, you're not going to take it so lightly. It happens to you. Right? Or, I don't know, maybe, maybe a, a different kind of more minor example. You're at some sporting event. Let's say you go to the state championships, and it's three days, and it's really, really intense. And your team might make the finals or... You as an individual might win a championship or something like that. And it's time takes on this very different notion. And it feels like a month. When you come back, you go, wow, I've been gone forever. You know, been way longer. So time slows down and the intensity of things goes way up. And maybe the last two minutes of the big game have this whole, there's a whole world in there. And you, people say, what? Oh, did the crowd help? The like, crowd? Oh, there are 40,000 people in the dome cheering for you. Like, who? You you know, you crowds, nothing. You're here. You're playing basketball or whatever. Okay? And you're caught in a different kind of world than sitting in sociology class listening to shambles go on with this stuff. Right? That's different. That's different. And so, yeah, I live in a meaningful world. There are a bunch of other possibilities. And a real interesting subject is how people move from one to the other to the other, when that occurs, and how that gets set up and happens. That's important. Um, yeah, multi you can have even multiple lives. A guy I knew in elementary school came from a family of five kids, big family, happy family to all appearances and so on. And my father was an uh, insurance salesman. And one day, it turns out his dad had a whole other family in another city big family. That happened to me. <laughs> How weird must that be? For my friend to see, you know, sees his dad and all of a sudden, who are you? I mean, not to mention the wife, right? But where did you come from? It's like a Law and Order episode or something. Okay. All right. Number five. I live in a meaningful world. Things have significance. They aren't just sheer objects. Um, and things and people uh, exist for me in my scheme of plans, I say, right? Uh, uh, and I don't know. There, in discussions lately about guns, there's been a lot of stuff about baseball bats killing more people than guns or something. I don't think it's true, but whatever. Is a baseball bat a weapon or a toy? That's a, an easy sort of thing. A uh, different kind of example, shoes. I thought it was just this morning in another class. So, um, you know, if you're, let's say you're a farmer, or you're a soldier, it's better. Soldiers walk a lot, right? So their shoes, their boots, are really, really important. It's really important that your boots fit if you're in the army. Women on the Upper East Side of New York, shoes are a different thing. It's not something you, so to speak, walk in. <laughs> That's not the point of shoes. If you're shopping, you know, wherever people from Manila Blahnik or whatever, right? That's a different kind of thing for a shoe. It has a different significance. And in the example I gave earlier, there are some men in the world who find a woman's shoe real appealing, if you know what I'm saying. That's different. That's not, she's like a gas. She's, that's not what I had in mind. Well, that's not what the soldier had in mind either, right? People have different things they do with shoes and different meanings and significance to different kinds of objects, right? Or or somebody gives you a gift. Okay, so you get a present, and maybe it's, um, uh, I don't know, I'm an example to do it. Maybe it's a book. So people give you a book. And so Christmas, you know, was some weeks ago, and some I'm in fault in, right? I, we do Christmas every day. And I've always enjoyed it since I was a kid. I thought it was great. So somebody gives you a book. There are at least three different ways you can see that book. Number one, uh, it might be that the person gave you the book because they really liked it. 
and they want to share. And you know people do this, right? They, they give their gifts as sort of something they're trying to pass on to other people. Second possibility is they're giving you the book because they think you would like the book, which is a totally different proposition. They went out and thought about what you would like that book to get. Third possibility is they're giving you the book because, and this could be true of any book, because they think it would convey something to you about how they see you. So this is the way I always try to think of gifts in general. You're not trying to give them a thing, okay? They could go buy the dang book. That's not a problem. Right? You're trying to express something to the person about how you see them. Now, this can be a tricky business, obviously. The person can get their feelings hurt. They're like, why are you giving me chicken soup for the teenage soul? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm 50. <laughs> B. I don't have these issues, you know, I'm like, what is, what's the message here? No, no, I just don't give up. Okay. Right? But you're, you're conveying something with these objects. And all sorts of objects in the world have meaning for us in lots of different ways. So you go in my office and, uh, okay, let's see. Okay. Um, when I moved to to Clinton, 1981, late 20s, and I, a, a very nice fellow on the faculty here helped me with an older guy. He volunteered. He didn't know me from that night. He saw me in the hallway. I'm like, oh, I'm welcome to Hamilton. He said, I don't know. He said, I'm moving in. So he came down and he's helping me cart all these boxes out of a big mill truck. And he pulls a box out and he goes, oh, what's this? And I said to him, and he opens it. Right? And inside is a, a mug from the 1964 New York City World, New York World's Fair. Right? I was a coffee out of the meeting. Oh, it's a silly one. Okay. Anyway, it's a souvenir. New York City World's Fair, 1964. And this mug was a gift to me from a very dear friend. Okay? Um, uh, who's uh, much older than I am and so on. Anyway, it has a huge significance. And I said to him, just be careful, and said, that's probably the single most valuable thing I own. Whereupon he immediately dropped it. And it shattered. And there was this amazing sort of moment in my life <laughs> where I had to make a little decision. And I was totally conscious of it. And I mean, it couldn't have lasted more than half a second. I had to decide which was more important to me, right? This guy is trying to help me. I don't think he did it deliberately, although time was weird. <laughs> 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 you, know, I mean, you know, I think he just got spooked or something. Right? But I had to decide which was more important. You know, am I going to hurt this guy's feelings, or am I going to, you know. And he drops shadows, and I'm like, oh, man. And he says, oh, my God. And I said, no, no, don't worry. It's really, it, it was just a I sort of lied. <laughs> you know, but that was the decision, right? It's like, how are you going to relate to various objects in your life? And it is, in that sense at least, some kind of choice. And this is what Sartre is going to talk about in his article on existence. You make choices like that all the time. How important is this or not? And it's, I had a half a second to think about it, but a part of the half a second was realizing if I stand here and think about it, he knows, right? You know, that's not good. So it had to be like, boom, right there. You know? So it's meaningful. Things are meaningful. All right, let's see. Great uh, meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is, there's more to it than this, actually. Um, obviously. So everything has this kind of significance. Archaeology, a lot of what archaeology does, archaeologists go out. You know, Tom Jones, Charles Pat, they go after the Nevada or wherever they go. And they dig up stuff and they figure out who are the people based on the stuff they dig up. So they find a certain bowl that's shaped a certain way, right? Or artifacts of various sort. A fork, a fork tells you a lot about human beings. 
and what they eat and how they eat it. You know, and the miracle of a fork is not the multiple times. That's, that part's easy. That's just like an elaborated knife. The interesting part's the curve. The bowl, the dip in, in the shape of a fork, which was invented or designed in mm, roughly 1500. They came up with that shape for a fork. That shape has been there for 500 years. That's how good it is. And this is a world where things happen fast and change real fast. The forks have been around for 500 years. And you can tell the way a human being eats and the shape of their mouth and all sorts of things by the way a fork is, is new. A pen would be another good example. All sorts of chairs, fabulous example. People find, you walk into old houses, like our house was built in 1850, so it's not quite old enough. But if you got, if you go, you go in a building built in 1780, the doorways are low because people were small. Right? So all the objects around us have that meshedness with us. They fit us. They fit who we are and how we do things. And so you can learn a lot about people by the kind of objects they have around them. Those objects reflect who they are. And objects have different meaning for different people. Um, when I was in college, I lived with some guys at one point. And uh, we, this was in Florida. Florida's filled with roaches. I mean, like palmetto bugs. They're big cockroaches. Big. And they are everywhere. You can't get rid of them. I mean, like, we tried to put pans of water on our bed or something like that, but whatever. Right. Anyway, in the, the living room, living room of this place we lived, there was a, an old Newsweek magazine. You know Newsweek? Kind of semi-funk now, but it was a magazine. Anyway, there was an old Newsweek lying on that. We used to use it to kill cockroaches. That was the purpose of that Newsweek magazine. Oh, hey! Bam! <laughs> that sort of thing, right? Mosquitoes on the wall are also going to get a little pad and a little buzz. Yeah. Okay, that was what Newsweek was for, <laughs> from our point of view. Different example, I would see people, and they had this device that looks like, I don't know if you've ever seen a pair of scissors, only the ends are not a pair of scissors. The ends are um, like little... Um, Little notches up and down the end, and they, they clamp together like this and lock. Have you ever seen them? Call a hemostat. So nurses walk around the hospital with hemostats hanging off their hemostat. Use it to clamp off blood vessels that have been cut. You also you can use it for a lot of stuff, right? It's a useful device. It basically is a uh, you know it's like a clamp that's designed like a pair of scissors, but it squeezes things together like this. Well, there were people, believe it or not, in the late 60s, early 70s, who used this thing to hold marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> called a roach clip was the technical term. It's a hemostat. It comes from hospitals, you understand? There are walk college kids walking around hemostat. <coughs> oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, you're, you're very serious, aren't you? EMT, I got that. <laughs> okay? Because then they could smoke the thing all the way down, right? Different meaning of different objects. And the parents, you know, would see that. Oh, I'm, not. Oh, uh, I'm thinking about going into nursing. <laughs> okay. All right. Number six. I live in a meaningful world. Let me just pause now. Again, the world here is obviously not the earth. It's, it's the world I live in, the Lebensfeld, the live reality. Okay. Now, interest, it's a world. That is to say, it fits together. Stuff all fits together in sensible, in relatively sensible ways. I'm teaching, you're being a student. This is great. And we got a particular kind of room, and you've got equipment. Everybody right there's paper and their pen. And there's some books, and there's a whiteboard, and there's an outline, and it all kind of makes good sense. Right? Suppose you walk into class one day and say, okay, everybody got everybody got a, a, a turtleneck sweater? 
Chelsea should be passing out the turtle <laughs> <laughs> At that point, you go, what do you think? Yeah. That experiment. <laughs> Professor's being weird, right? I took social psych. I know how this works. <laughs> Jen Borden does this kind of stuff. Or something of that sort, right? You, you, you try to fit the stuff in, things that are anomalies, you try to fit them into the world so that, they, so that it continues to make sense. Right? And all the different pieces go together that you recognize the chairs, those tables, and a cup. Shambles is okay. okay. Most likely water. <laughs> That's what you're thinking. Something because his mouth is a little dry, not he's staying drunk to do it. <laughs> Which happens. <laughs> or it's not like there's some marbles in there. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very strange. Wouldn't make sense. And what's interesting, so so you kind of laugh because it's such a ludicrous situation. But it's not clear. I mean, how do you know what goes with what? kind of learn some of that along the way and you teach little kids like that. You, we, we don't do that here. No, you just, no, honey, we can't do that. Okay, and after a while, you, you know, you kind of figure out how the world fits together and what's supposed to go with what. Now, it's also true, and we'll get into this in a little more detail as well later, that you can fit yourself into the world in all kind of cool ways. So I can walk over to um, uh, Beinecke and walk in the or the diner, and there's what I recognize as an ATM, right? an automatic teller machine, automated teller machine. I actually know somebody who's involved in creating this. Who I went to college with back in the mid '70s and started working for Citibank, Citicorp is called, it? and we started creating ATM. Oh my God, it's amazing. And I recognize you go in and you take, you know, a little piece of plastic out of your wallet and you stick it in the cushion button. Money comes out. <laughs> this is great. Free money. That's what a friend of mine called ATM. Free money. <laughs> and you know how to do that, right? Or you know how to, um, uh, it's kind of magic. You, I lived in New York City last spring. I'm on the Hamilton program. And you can, you can walk out on the street in New York. This is great. I don't know if you ever done it. You can walk out on, on the corner of the street in New York and do this. And a guy, usually, will pull over in a yellow automobile and will give you a ride anywhere <laughs> in exchange for money. <laughs> now, the interesting part is, I don't know this guy. <laughs> he could be like, Anybody. There's no telling where he's taking me. <laughs> and I'll do that. And I do it with this kind of implicit faith in the world. Like, nothing bad's going to happen. That's an astonishing act. It's an astonishing act. Topped only by getting on an airplane. Which is really an act of faith. Oh yeah, this thing will stay up. <laughs> you know, the people who made it, they must know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never met any of them. I have no idea who's sitting up front, right? But you can gear into the world. In simpler examples, you can gear in in the sense of you come to Hamilton as an institute, and you, you go to some little event, and you walk up to somebody and say, "Hi, how are you?" You know, I'm I'm Josh. I'm Glory. Hi, how are you, Sarah? Nice to meet you. Okay, she hadn't hit me yet. Right? In other words, you start connecting with other people. You know all these tricks for connecting to the world around you and how to make stuff work and how to go to the, the dining hall and get food, things of that sort. Okay, now, all of that gets us seen. That is, normally you don't think about any of this in business, right, or very little of it. You only think about it when stuff goes wrong and it doesn't work and you go, what's, what's happening here? Let's figure this out. There must be a rational explanation for all of this which is another good assumption, right? Oh, well, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm sure there's a good reason. Oh, yeah, fell off. Oh. You assume this, this kind of world. Now, what we think of as mental illness, certain forms of it, may involve the breakdown of that sense. 
that the world works and things make sense and they all fit together, where you start seeing things as disjointed and incoherent. This is, again, this is not a good place to be. Right? It's horrible place to be, actually. But that happens. But it's a, relatively speaking, it's an anomaly. Okay? It's not the normal state. Normally speaking, the world fits together for us. And what's interesting, kind of philosophically, we didn't have to put it together. You didn't have to see all these different objects and say, okay, I think I'll do this with this and drink some water. You know, oh, I'll, I'll go up to somebody and say, huh, you know, you pretty well worked that out naturally as you grow up. It didn't, it's not like, you know, there's a handbook that explains all this. Not at all. You assume, we might say, the worldness of the world. We assume the hanging togetherness of all of these things. Alright? Okay. Part two, and I'm just going to go through these quickly here. In the last two minutes. Because it's less important. Right. This world spreads out around them. It's a social kind of world, right? So it spreads out spatially and temporally and socially. Spatially, it spreads out in the sense of you know that there's. Um, <laughs> Right now, you believe, at least, I mean, you really believe, that there's an outside to this classroom. Right? That if you walk out of the door, there's stuff going on out there, and there are people. And, and then you, you know, you turn around, that's not hard to do. It's still there. <laughs> hey, that's good. I, I, Seeing you walk out, <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> and then when you turn around, you can walk back in. It's, this is still here, right? There's a kind of continuity. And it goes both ways. It's symmetrical. So you can imagine a great episode in some weird movie like The Matrix. Somebody walks out and they turn around, they look back, there's nothing there. The room they just left doesn't exist anymore. Like it sort of closes up behind you or something. But that's not how the world works. And you know that it's sort of spread out spatially. And you can go to Utica. What a thrill. You know, and you kind of believe that it exists out there. And it's not that you exist that you know about it because there's a map. It's because maybe people have told you or you've been there, and, you know, and you have this kind of implicit feeling that that stuff is out there. All right? And that's evident in the way you live. Let me give you another example, another version of that. Temporally, the world spreads out. That is, uh, you live at a certain location in time. Right? Now, there's a lot of neat stuff written about how you create your, your time, and we'll, we'll actually get into that some. But, but you have a past that matters to you, right? and in terms of which you think of yourself, you think, I'm just an average girl from Chittenango. Right? I'm from Franklin's friend. I'm proud of it. Right, you know Franklin Springs? Right. Franklin Springs is sort of a suburb. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Or Oriskany Falls. I'm from Oriskany Falls. You know, and that you have a past there. Or you think of yourself as the kid who was high school valedictorian. And that may be a big part of who you are now. Right? In the way that when I say, well, I was a competitive swimmer in high school, that's still a big part of my identity. Cheaper. I'm 60 years old. You know, get over it, fella. <laughs> but it's still a thing, right? It's still something that's there in your past. And you also have a future. Now, you don't have a future in the sense of you've physically done it already. I understand that. It's sort of imagined, but it's importantly imagined. That is to say, it's here with you right now. You are already, and you didn't have to think of it. You're living towards a certain kind of future. And the evidence for that is that you're sitting here taking notes. Okay? You imagine that this, so to speak, is going somewhere. This course, or being in college, or your life, or something like that. Right? Now, if, God forbid, somebody's whispered in your ear right now, you know, actually, you're going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. Right? This is it. you got 24 hours. You're like, hell with sociology. <laughs> I'm out of here. You know, you got better things to do, right? 
So you're the way that you're sitting here and acting right now, testify. It's a it's your own witness to your future. It's your statement, your declaration. That's the way to put it. You're you're making a lived declaration about your own future right now as you sit here. You believe that you will live a certain amount of time and be doing certain kinds of things. I can see it. The future is implicit in the way you live right now. So the world spreads out around you in the past and in the future in both of those ways. And it also spreads out around you socially. You know, Facebook and all that's just a great thing. And I like Facebook. I'm, I do Facebook. I don't do it with current students. Just so you know. One has to draw one. <laughs> but it's kind of cool. And I, it, it's made me, it's changed actually the way I think about certain things. Like I've got these former students and stuff to do. And I sort of feel like I'm in this web of these people and they're doing this and this and this. And some people are kind of doing this. I mean, like people, I have, a, I have a Facebook friend who does nothing but animal rights and stuff. That's all she does. And I got another one who does nothing but wind power. She's real mad about wind power. Wind. Okay, fine. You know, part of my world, sort of, <laughs> out there a little bit, you know? And you're kind of located in this network of people. All right, now, let me finish up a couple of, a couple of closing thoughts about this. Um, <coughs> I believe in the, in the coherence of my world. Right? I believe in the continuity of it. In other words, I think I'm going to get up tomorrow and do pretty much the same thing that I'm doing today, more or less, which is a great comfort, by the way, to get over. I mean, I really, like this is the first day of this class, I really enjoy it. Just so you know, I'd be happy doing this forever. Walk into class, oh, say things, sometimes people laugh. That's good. It, it doesn't happen to me in the rest of my life. So, I mean, sometimes they're not there. So the continuity of the world, believing things will kind of go on more or less as they are. All, right. All of that's implicit. Uh, you also have faith. I say faith, for instance, in getting in the airplane. So I, you know, I walk out there and there's this big metal thing. I mean, it looks like metal. Aluminum and titanium and aluminum. At least I think that's what's made of. That's what they told me. Who's that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just paper. They just paint it real silvery. <laughs> you know, and then you climb on and there are these people and they look like they know what they're doing. And the pilot comes up, and you think the pilot comes on, probably reporting. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be flying into Chicago at uh, 37,000 feet. 37,000 feet? <laughs> <laughs> You're like there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's okay. The pilot sounds like he knows what he's doing. Never met the guy. Have no idea. Could be an eight year old. They got a special voice thing. <laughs> you know, they change it. You go in there like, hi. <laughs> You don't know. You have no earthly idea. You put this tremendous faith in other people, which is part of what it is to be a self in society, right? If you believe there are other people out there, they're doing things, it all makes sense, and so on. Right? You even believe that, that you know, when you, when you get up in the morning, stuff's still going to work the right way. Maybe I've said this sort of thing in other classes. You've heard, you know, you ever go to sleep with your head belonging to the bed? Yeah, once or twice. <laughs> you wake up and go, oh, 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 as objective. That is, you think it's real. Like all of this stuff has a kind of solidity and stability to you. Thank God. Alright? I mean, if I walked into class every day thinking students might not be there, you know, like I walk in and there's nobody here, I think I got the wrong room. The wrong this actually happened to me once. <laughs> when I went the wrong day. And I'm like a Wednesday for a Tuesday class. Well, the second day, I mean, once I realized it was wrong day, I realized 
I didn't go to class yesterday. <laughs> and I'm the professor. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good at all. But but it happens. You know, it happens, right? And you have bad dreams for 30 years. But <laughs> well, where am I? Where's my? Um, at any rate, you you know, we kind of take these things as objective, like the world works. You know, faculty member shows up, students are going to be there, and they we do stuff and we have a class. It's great. Well. What our discussion should have suggested to you is that, well, maybe that's not. I mean, yeah, the stuff's all here and it's really happening, and it's pretty reliable, statistically speaking. Like, you will come to class on Thursday, I know. But it's not really clear what holds that up. Like, you all, all of you, I mean, typically one or two students might miss a class you know, on Thursday, so that's the way it seems to go. But if all 45 people here spontaneously decided on the same day not to go to class, I mean, if you organize it, that's different. That's like another one of those experiments or something like that. But one day, just it happens that I just hit the bad number, and nobody should. That would be very odd. And even odder, maybe, is if I didn't show up the same day. <laughs> The stuff happens. So anyway, so part of what we'll do in the course is try to reconcile this, again, this fact of this tremendous freedom that we have in all these ways we've talked about, reconcile that with the fact that things actually are quite predictable in life. And try to figure out how that works. Okay? So read the Sartre for Thursday and see that.